department and the ENT department, mm -hmm. okay? So we will demonstrate to you the ear model, starting from the fe uh, features from the external ear to the inner ear. The physiology aspect is on a hearing pathway, I think. Theories of hearing, okay? Then uh, pathology, we'll talk about the pathological aspect, some pathological problems with the ear. Only ear? Not ear, nasal. Ah, nasal cap. Then uh, ENT will, uh, staff will demonstrate the endoscopic, uh, it's an endoscopic demonstration of the structures of the nose, ear and larynx. Okay? So I invite the first speaker, Dr. Jyoti, from the Department of Anatomy to demonstrate the model of the ear. Give her a clap. Before and after. Before and after. This is the model of the ear. Active model. Here mainly consists of three different parts. So you all know it. It is the external ear, the middle ear and the inner ear. This is the external ear which mainly consists of auricle or pinna and the external acoustic meatus. Okay? So this is the auricle which is made up of single piece of yellow elastic cartilage. Okay? So now I am removing the anterior wall of the external acoustic meatus where you can see its cavity. This is the anterior wall of the external acoustic meatus. Now, you are seeing this cavity. This is the external acoustic meatus, which is made up of two parts. Lateral one third is cartilaginous, which is continuous with the cartilage of this auricle. The medial two third, around 16 millimeter. The total length of external acoustic meatus is around 24 millimeter. So, the lateral one third means it constitutes about 8 millimeter which is cartilaginous and the medial two-third part is bony, okay, which is about 16 millimeter, okay. So, external acoustic meatus extends from the base of the pinna till the tympanic membrane. So, tympanic membrane is the partition between the external ear and the middle ear. This cavity, what is seen here, can you all see it? This cavity, this is a middle ear cavity. This is the roof of the middle ear. So roof of the middle ear is made up of thin plate of bone called as tegment tympani. Tegment tympani is a part of petrous part of the temporal bone. So middle ear and inner ear both are housed in the petrous part of the temporal bone. Now I am removing the roof of the middle ear. Okay. So roof has been removed. So roof is formed by a thin plate of bone which is the tegment tympani which separates the middle ear cavity from the middle cranial fossa. So on the middle cranial fossa, temporal lobe of the brain or the cerebrum will be on the middle cranial fossa. So this is the tegment tympani which is removed now. This is the cavity of the middle ear. This is the cavity of the middle ear. This is the tympanic membrane which is removed. Okay, so this is the tympanic membrane. Can you see the tympanic membrane? Tympanic membrane is an oval, semi-transparent, pearly grey color structure which forms a partition between the external ear and the middle ear. To the inner surface of the tympanic membrane, handle of malleus is attached. So as we all know, tympanic membrane is a trilaminar germ disc. It is derived from all the three germ layers. Outer surface is from the ectoderm, middle layer is from the mesoderm and inner layer is from the endoderm. Okay? So outer surface is covered with the skin which is continuous with the skin of the pinna and the external acoustic meatus. The inner surface is covered with the mucous membrane which is continuous with the mucous membrane of the middle ear cavity. In the center it is a fibrous tissue which is derived from the mesoderm. This tympanic uh, membrane has got attachment of the handle of the malleus, okay? So, handle of malleus is attached between the outer mucous membrane and inner fibrous layer. 
medial to the handle of malleus there is one more process you can see this is the long process of incus okay so this malleus has got head the neck this is the anterior process which is projecting anteriorly this is the lateral process which is attached to the tympanic membrane and this is the handle of the malleus okay from the lateral process two malleolar folds extends upwards anterior and posterior malleolar fold so the area of the tympanic membrane above the malleolar fold is pars flaccida pars flaccida because it is lax in structure below the malleolar flow fold the major most part of the tympanic membrane is formed by is called as pars tensa it is tensed by the pulling of pull of the handle of the malleus handle of malleus will pull the tympanic membrane towards the middle ear cavity so tympanic membrane is has got concavity laterally and convexity towards the middle ear okay so you can see two ossicles which are attached the head of the malleus will articulate with the body of the incus to form saddle shaped incudo malleolar joint okay now this incus has got long process the long process of the incus the lower end is turned medially to form a lenticular process which articulates with the head of the incus end of the stapes to form ball and socket incudo stapedial joint okay so you can see the stapes stapes has got a head neck two crura or the two limbs and the foot plate the foot plate or the oval shaped plate plate which fits into the fenestra vestibuli or the fossa ovalis fenestra ovalis of the inner ear okay so this is the middle ear if you see here this is the anterior wall of the middle ear which is formed by two bony canals in the upper part so this two bony canal the upper canal the brown shaded area this is the canal for tensor tympani muscle the lower canal is the canal for bony part of auditory tube so there is a bony partition between the canal for tensor tympani and canal for the auditory in the lower part there is a bony canal for internal carotid artery can you see the internal carotid artery here okay so lower part of the anterior wall has got a bony canal which has got internal carotid artery upper part of the anterior wall has got two horizontal canals the upper canal is for canal for tensor tympani lower canal is for canal for bony part of the auditory tube okay so this auditory tube connects the middle ear with the nasopharynx that's how the air enters into the middle ear cavity through the nose okay this is the posterior wall opposite to the anterior wall is a posterior wall okay so posterior wall has got mastoid air cells or the mastoid antrum which communicates with adductus to antrum through adductus to antrum the posterior wall has got mastoid antrum so this is anterior wall the posterior wall the lateral wall has been removed which is formed by the tympanic membrane the medial wall is mainly formed by the projections of the parts of the inner ear okay like promontory which is formed by the basal turn of the cochlea so now we'll go into the inner ear okay so we can remove the parts of the inner ear okay this is the inner ear inner ear is mainly formed by two parts membranous labyrinth and the bony labyrinth outside is the membranous labyrinth inside the membranous labyrinth is the bony lab inside the bony labyrinth is a membranous lab so outside is a bony inside is a membranous so bony labyrinth has got a perilymph membranous labyrinth has a endolymph so the parts of the bony labyrinth is the cochlea you can see it is like a shape of a snail you can see the turns two three fourths of the turns it forms okay this is a cochlea which has got cochlea duct inside it next this expanded part this is the vestibule okay these three rings what you are seeing these are the semicircular canals okay so cochlea vestibule and semicircular canals these three forms part of bony labyrinth so inside the bony labyrinth like 
cochlea has got cochlear duct inside it the vestibule has got saccule and utricle within it and semicircular canals has got semicircular ducts okay so now i have removed in a section the cochlea part so can you see it in the center the brownish part this is the central support for the cochlea it is called as modiolus okay around the modiolus the cochlea takes 2 3 4 turns okay so whatever dots is the cut section of the cochlear ducts you are seeing it and this is the cochlear nerve which is emerging the out okay so this cochlea yes, has got the receptors for hearing that is a spiral organ of cortex okay mainly for the hearing the vestibule has got saccule and utricle which has got maculae which is the receptors for the equilibrium that is for the static equilibrium <coughs> semicircular canals are three different types okay one is a so when it is placed like this the one which is facing upwards is superior semicircular canal the one which is facing posteriorly is a posterior semicircular canal this is the lateral semicircular canals so these three semicircular canals has got the crista ampullaris the here for the uh, kinetic equilibrium that will be dealt in detail in the physiology part so this is the inner ear which has got the cochlea the vestibule and the semicircular canals okay so now you saw the external ear which has got the pinna the external acoustic meatus which ends at the tympanic membrane the middle ear cavity with its anterior wall the posterior wall mainly formed by mastoid antrum and mastoid acels the inner ear with these parts so this is the petrous part if you turn posteriorly so there is a now you can see a foramina posterior aspect which now is coming out through this foramina cochlea now vestibular cochlea now facial now seventh and eighth cranial now so what is this internal this is a internal acoustic meatus what you are seeing from the posterior aspect so this whole thing forms a petrous part of the temporal bone which houses the middle ear cavity and the inner ear <coughs> see from far okay maybe you need to okay another thing got the uh, external ear middle ear everything so you know the parts of anatomy now so functional aspects we will go through in video try to understand whatever possible now so meantime within few uh, days we are going to start uh, actual classes so that time you will understand in a better way definitely it's like a trailer you will understand the general concepts of physics because it's not so easy to understand all the concepts theory of theory hearing if i tell within 10 15 minutes not possible but you just go through the videos where it lot of uh, animations are given here just go through it is definitely helpful and if any doubts then i will try to clarify that uh, please last uh, first one this So this is how the conduction occurs. Then transduction. Let us. sense of hearing is accomplished by a process known as auditory transduction. The ear converts sound waves in the air into electrical impulses which can be interpreted by the brain. 
As sound enters the ear, it passes through the external auditory canal, where it meets the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane then vibrates in response to the sound. Sounds of a lower pitch, or frequency, produce a slower rate of vibration. And sounds of lower volume, or amplitude, produce a less dramatic vibration. Higher frequency sounds produce faster vibrations. The tympanic membrane is cone-shaped and articulates with a chain of three bones called the auditory ossicles. They consist of the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The movements of the tympanic membrane vibrate the ossicles, passing on the information of frequency and amplitude. The three bones pivot together on an axis shown here in red. The pivotal axis is due to a series of ligaments which hold the bones in place within the middle ear cavity. The anterior malleal ligament and the posterior incutal ligament are of particular importance for the pivotal axis. Two structures which normally obscure this view of the middle ear have been removed. They are the chordae tympani nerve and the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle. Through the ossicles, the vibrations of the tympanic membrane are transferred to the footplate of the stapes. The stapes moves with a piston-like action, which sends vibrations into a structure called the bony labyrinth. The labyrinth is filled with a fluid called paralymph. If it were a completely closed and inflexible system, the movement of the stapes would be unable to displace the paralymph, and therefore unable to send vibrations into the bony structure. Due to the flexibility of a membrane called the round window, the stapes movement can displace the paralymph, allowing vibrations to enter the labyrinth. The corridor leading to the round window is found within the spiral portion of the bony labyrinth known as the cochlea. Vibrations produced by the stapes are drawn into the spiral system and return to meet the round window. The portion of the spiral passage in which vibrations ascend to the apex of the cochlea is called the scala vestibuli. The descending portion of the passage is called the scala tympani. A third structure, called the cochlear duct, is situated between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. The cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph, and when viewed in cross-section, the membranes separating the two fluid-filled systems are visible. They are Reissner's membrane and the basilar membrane. The membranes are flexible and move in response to the vibrations traveling up the scale of vestibuli. The movements of the membranes then send vibrations back down to the scale of tympani. A specialized structure called the organ of corti is situated on the basilar membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the organ of corti is stimulated, which sends nerve impulses to the brain via the cochlear nerve. The actual nerve impulses are generated by specialized cells within the organ of corti called hair cells. The hair cells are closely covered by a structure called the tectorial membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the tiny clusters of hairs are bent against the tectorial membrane, triggering the hair cells to fire. The entire basilar membrane does not vibrate simultaneously. Instead, specific areas along the basilar membrane move variably in response to different frequencies of sound. Lower frequencies vibrate the basilar membrane closer to the apex of the cochlea, 
whereas higher frequencies produce vibrations closer to the base. This arrangement is known as tonotopic organization. Together, this sequence of events is responsible for our acoustic perception of the world around us. impulses to be delivered to the brain. The organ of Corti is located in the cochlea, a spiral, three-chambered, snail-like structure, 10 millimeters wide, within a bony matrix. The organ of Corti extends from the anterior part of the vestibule and coils for about two and a half turns around a bony pillar called the modialis. In cross section, the uppermost chamber is called the scala vestibuli. The oval window is situated at the base of this chamber. The lowermost chamber is called the scala tympani. At the base of this chamber is where the round window is located. Both the scala vestibuli and scala tympani contain perilymph. Between the scala vestibuli and scala tympani is the scala media. This houses the organ of corti, which is referred to as the receptor organ of hearing. The scala media is filled with endolymph. The scala media includes structures from the tectorial membrane, basilar membrane, and hair cells, which sense the mechanical forces. The hair cells are located between the tectorial and basilar membranes. Approximately 16,000 hair cells are within the cochlea. There are two kinds of hair cells, inner and outer hair cells. 95% of the afferent fibers are from the inner hair cells, the sensory receptors that communicate with neurons from cranial nerve 8. Outer hair cells receive mostly efferent input from the superior olivary complex. The filamentous structures that connect the tips of adjacent stereocilia are known as tip links. These are thought to amplify the forces in the area of the molecular sensors. How does sound enter the cochlea? Compression hits the tympanic membrane, causing the stapes to transfer force to the oval window. The sound travels down the scala vestibuli, around the helicotrema, to the scala tympani, allowing its fluid perilymph to mix. From there, sound moves to the round window. High frequencies are encoded at the base and low frequencies at the apex. It is this property that leads to the tonotopic map along the base of a membrane. The manner in which the basilar membrane vibrates in response to sound is the key to understanding cochlear function. The hair cells are located between the tectorial and basilar membranes and are stimulated by the shearing force between the two caused by the pivot point of the two membranes. The pivot point of the basilar membrane becomes displaced the tectorial membrane moves across the tops of the hair cells, causing the stereocilia to bend. The ionic environment of the compartments plays a critical role in signal transduction.
The apical portion of the hair cell is bathed in high potassium solution, and the base of the hair cell is bathed in potassium poor solution. This causes the opening of mechanosensitive channels, allowing potassium to flow into the cell, leading to depolarization. This in turn opens calcium channels at the basal end of the cell, leading to vesicular transmitter release to stimulate the nerve Because the relative voltage and potassium levels are low at the base of the hair cell, potassium flows out of the cell. This establishes that potassium flow through the cell is used for both depolarization, potassium in at the apex, and repolarization, potassium out at the base of the hair cell. And, uh, there are many theories up there. Wall Bekasi has uh, put forth his theory. It's most accepted with her place theory, telephonic theory, and traveling wave theory. Different theories of hearings are there. So that we will discuss in the theory class. Okay, now you have understood the basic concepts of hearing. Fine? Any questions? Thank you. Some important lessons, there are so many things which we will not be able to tell you at the stretch now in integrated class. But uh, I will tell you some important things which we really need to know. Okay? Something in, when it comes to ear, it is something to do with functional defects which we come across. As such pathology we may not see much. But we do get cholesteatomas and some tumors rarely with the ear, inner ear. Otherwise, it's a nasal cavity which we are always worried about. And next, of course, is the throat, the larynx, laryngeal carcinomas, massive misuse of voice, laryngeal carcinomas. So we have been facing a lot of these nowadays. We are seeing a lot of cases. And uh, the most important thing and the mainstay is our nasal cavity, the maxillary, ethmoidal sinuses, and their lesions. Okay. So slowly, at this juncture, I want to tell you that carefully see the balance between physiology, normalcy and abnormalcy. So it's a very delicate balance. So when God has given us everything, maintenance of that is very, very important. Drastic misuse of any organ will lead to pathology. Okay? So careful use of your voice, careful use of your hearing. Why I am telling you is, now everybody is plugged with their ears phones. How much of hear loss, I mean, hearing loss we have in youngsters? There are so many people who have become deaf. But still, at any given point in the campus, I see people plugged like this. A car or something will be honking. We cannot hear because we are busy with something else. A lot of accidents have occurred because of this. Are you aware of that? Yes? A fellow moving in a van, he didn't even know that a train was coming. He went. And poor children died, school children. So that is why I am telling you, understanding of physiology, understanding of pathology. As medical students, we go a long way in trying to maintain everything as normal as possible. So that is why excessive talk, excessive screaming, excessive plugging ourselves, all should be controlled. I think we should come out of these habits. Okay? So delicately I will go through some important aspects. Okay? So one is nasal cavity and its infections. So whenever we have any lesion occurring in the nose, the first thing is block. Anything, let it be an edema of mucosa, this is block. When there is a block, what happens to the respiration? Difficulty. It can be unilateral, it can be bilateral. If it is unilateral, poor fellow, he breathes with the other nostril. If both are blocked, oral. Okay, so some problems like this, the patient comes to us. These are the complaints with which they come to us and that is called as symptoms. Then we examine them. 
and what we find is the okay so whenever it comes to this we find that there are areas where the patient comes with difficulty in breathing and we need to know what's happening so lesion can be in the nasal cavity it can be in the sinuses the maxillary the ethmoidal sinuses so when we carefully look into this we find that there are a varying degrees of lesions and varying causes for obstruction so i will deal with some which are really important one is infection associated with a particular protist called as rhinosporidiosis so it is a disease which commonly involves the nasopharynx the nasal cavity the nasopharynx and including the conjunctiva sometimes we can see in the posterior aspect of the tongue if it is extending down into the soft palate and this is initially it was thought to be a fungal infection but now we know it belongs to a protist called as mesomycetozoa okay so when we look into the actual thing whenever we swim or take bath or we come in contact with untreated waters or which are infected with this they get into infection so commonly children who swim in these waters tend to get infected in the nasal cavity initially they come back within a day or two they start getting nasal congestion some amount of sneezing or routine fever like syndromes finally they land up with edema of the mucosa it starts hanging down towards the nasal cavity and then it blocks it that is called as nasal pol can you see this particular boy completely he cannot breathe through one nostril when we examine we find that there is a edematous polyp like thing which is plugging down or involving the entire cavity and of course i don't think he can breathe any more with this so what do we do we excise it this is another case where there is a nasal mass here that is the polyp here it is extending down from the nasal cavity down to the soft palate and it has come down here can you see this sort of a pinkish dotted or the reticular structure that is seen that is again a mass which is involving the nasopharynx so with this what we do is we excise the polyp so answer is you have to remove it once we remove what do we see always i told you histopathology is the golden answer for the actual for the actual uh, commitment of what exactly it is so when we examine we find that can you see the nasal mucosal lining here yes and these are the sporangiospores so actually you can see the continuous development so initially it is small like this it starts growing in various sizes this is the mature one this once it is fully mature it breaks up and all of these are released outside and each one of that again embeds into the stroma and grows into a full form so that is why the mucosa keeps on expanding and it projects like a fog so this is one where the answer is you have to excise the lesion and maybe chances of recurrence is common if it is not completely be removed the other important aspects are the common nasal polyps where the patient keeps on having some allergy or something for which he has continuous draining or he will have an edematous mucosa which doesn't allow him to breathe so these are the nasal polyps which we call them as they are the non cancerous polypoid lesions seen within the nasal passages so some of the important sites one is involving the nasal cavity or the turbinate you can see these are the common areas where you can see the polyps can you see them those are the regions where they are expected to be seen these are generally excised and in our department we receive the specimens like this this is the stump which is being cut you can see the bleeding points and this is the entire nasal polyp which is being removed so microscopically what is the lining of the respiratory epithelium or lining of the nasal cavity is the respiratory epithelium so you find the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium and see the amount of edema which is seen in the underlying tissue so we find edema 
presence of edema is a important sign of inflammation and this again we classify into two things one is inflammatory i mean the allergic and the non allergic type if it is the non allergic type we do not find eosinophils so we put it as nasal polyp non allergic type if we find eosinophils i'll show you a few which show this is this the massive edema what i'm sure trying to show you can you see this dark reddish with two nuclei or bilobe nuclei not two it's a spectacle shaped bilobe nuclei these are all the plasma cells and the eosinophils which is rich in so can you see it see this is one eosinophil what i'm focusing for you so if you find many eosinophil that means it is a allergic process so we call it as inflammatory polyp allergic type so whenever we are allergic to like in cases of bronchial asthma or people who are allergic to various substances in the atmosphere they can show such allergic forms okay so this is our mainstay most of the time what we get is going to be these next very important sometimes we don't suspect anything but we turn out to find that there is something underlying and we may diagnose a case of carcinoma so this is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma which is one of the notorious tumors known to occur in the nasopharyngeal region the patient may have very mild signs and symptoms of headache because of the compression headache or sinusitis like problem or sometimes they even complain of nasal bleed suddenly some nasal bleed and on examination sometimes we find that the entire nasal cavity looks normal but further down we don't know what's happening so this is a common tumor seen in men and it is about uh something to do with uh, exposure to carcinogens because 85% are known to be smokers and quite some time they have been exposed to the smoking look at the age what is the age sixth decade so they have been exposed for quite some time okay so whatever said and done we keep on saying smoking is bad we say there are so many carcinogens in it but yet we all are paying money happily buying it and introducing ourselves to the carcinogen so this is irony but it is the fact you ask any patient when are you smoking from yeah i used to be a smoker i am no more a smoker okay so from when have you quit smoking just from day before yesterday so that is how they come to us but sadly there is other things which see always any malignancy doesn't just come overnight there are some things which we should be exposed to there are some things which we are vulnerable to so that is why they said see he is smoking from 25 years nothing has happened to me i started smoking from 5 years i have already got a tumor so that means to say our genetics play a very important role apart from genetics there are environmental factors the factors can be in the form of mutations it can be in the form of radiations it can be in the form of a virus epstein barr virus is known to be one of the potent carcinogen agent which can induce malignancy so this is one of the tumors which is commonly associated with the ebv epstein barr virus thankfully we are not a endemic area where we have ebv but african countries and central and south africa are known to have these viruses and there these tumors are very very common but we still have cases and we have reported plenty of these cases may or may not be associated with ebv okay so some of the areas where you can see is the nasal cavity they may extend into the nasal cavity paranasal sinuses orbit sometimes extend into the skull base and brain so whenever we have a doubt that the patient is having a lingering problem but we are not external examination we are not able to make out we ask for a ct or an mri so in such cases can you see in this case you can find that there is a huge lesion sitting here can you see this so this tells us that something is there in such cases we do an either a scopy as they are going to demonstrate or we do an invasive method where we go and take a biopsy and come out if it is accessible to the outer surface and what do we see when we see such a picture where it is full of sheets of tumor cells can you make out 
tumor cells and can you see that there is variation in the size and shape of the nuclei from one cell to the other. They are so compactly arranged and can you see the delicate five the capillaries running between the tumor cells. This is a part of antigenetic activity of the tumor where tumor cells tend to produce certain vasogenic agents. These tend to stimulate the blood vessels and they grow very fast within the tumor and their intention is trying to get blood supply. So this is a sort of what to say this is a sabotage of the aeroplane like that. They, they try to take the blood vessels into control, allow them to grow and they start diverting the blood supply to themselves to have a good growth. Also they have a lot of mitotic activity that means they reproduce very fast. One of the important features of malignancy is the cells keep on dividing and restless they keep on dividing and they tend to show normally what is the uh, number of poles in the dividing uh, nucleus? Two. Two poles with the spindle, bipolar. Here you can see that they are having so many poles, see each one is a pole. This is a multipolar mitosis, can you see? So such star shaped polar activity or division of cells indicates that it is malignancy. So when you find sheets of tumor cells, pleomorphism, variation in size of the nucleus that is what it is called as and you find multipolar mitosis that means actively dividing cells we call it as a malignancy. So this is an esophageal carcinoma. You can see that this is the tumor. Now we have done an in situ hybridization to find out whether it has an origin from EBV. Here whatever the staining you are seeing is the Epstein Barr virus which is seen in the cytoplasm. Can you see them as blue structures? That means to say yes Epstein Barr virus is there within the tumor cells and that is a definite evidence to tell us that it is caused by EBV. Okay. So this is one of the important investigations we do further to know whether it is having a source of EBV or not. Okay. So any doubts? So apart from this we have laryngeal carcinoma that is just a squamous cell carcinoma most of the time. So I didn't purposely present it because uh, anyway squamous cell carcinoma will be dealing with everywhere. So these are the main things which we need to know in an ENT forum. Anything else you want to know or you have any doubts? Thank you. Very good afternoon to all of you. Mm -hmm. Myself, I am Dr. Surya Prakash, Professor Dr. Sanjay Patil, this is Dr. Aishwarya. We are here to give orientation, integrated teaching. Right? You all have been doing dissection, right? So you see with the uh, bare eyes, you see everything. You just know Madam was telling like how to see with microscope. We see with microscope, we do the study, everything, we find out what is the problem, we were diagnosed everything. From between seeing with bare eyes and under the microscope comes the endoscope. Basically in ENT, we see everything with endoscopes. Most of the visualization happens in endoscope because in ENT you know that you are seeing in air, nose, throat, which are narrow spaces, dark spaces when there is no light, unless you provide light from outside. You do a clinical examination, after doing a clinical examination, if you get any doubt, yes, there is a pathology there, somewhere there. So next step comes doing an endoscopy to see exactly what is the problem. And accordingly, number one, finding out the physiological functions is working normally or not, then the pathological functions. Pathology not functions, any pathology disease, what it is. And if required, we take a biopsy also with this particular thing. So to go to the lab, you need a biopsy. That biopsy you have to take and give. That is process, stain, and then you start giving a diagnosis, what is it. So for all those things, we need the endoscope. Right. So we will show you like how the ear looks, how the nose looks. So it is not working. So when you see from outside, you see the ear, everything, right? So all this you see, you will be able to see the external ear. Right. So inside the external ear, you know that it is composed of external artery canal, that is bony and cartilaginous. Inner, it is bony, outer part is cartilaginous. Right. 
So normally you can see usually up to the cartilaginous portion only, bony portion you will not be able to see unless you have a special instrument to see that. And in case if there is a perforation, like for example somebody comes to me with hearing loss, I am not able to hear properly. So first thing what you have to rule out is when somebody comes with hearing loss, is there any problem in the external ear and the tympanic membrane? You all know in physiology how the hearing happens. The sound goes, falls on the tympanic membrane, the tympanic membrane vibrates, moves and then the ossicles move. Right, this in turn will move the inner ear fluids and you are able to hear. The hair cells which conduct the signals and processing happens in your brain and you are able to hear. Right, for that the first prerequisite is your eardrum. Whether the eardrum is proper or not, first it is the one which receives. Your external ear is open or not. Okay, so we are going inside now. Right. Okay, you see this is the pinna. Right, as we go external artery canal. We go inside the external artery canal. See, so much hair is there. Can you see the hair? So, normally external artery canal contains hair and adnexal structures, your glands. Okay, modified sebaceous and sweat glands which produce wax. Okay, which produce wax, otherwise we call as cerumen. Sometimes that itself can be the problem to cause hearing problem. There could be so much of wax accumulation there that it will block the ear completely, you will not be able to hear at all. Okay, you will not be able to hear at all. Okay, and this wax changes from person to person. Some people have very hard wax, some people have very soft wax. Hard wax, soft wax. Okay, in hard, hard wax people, it becomes so difficult to remove also. Some people produce very less wax, some people produce too much wax. That's again is related to the climatic conditions, all those things. Right, if you see the whales here, whale, here is full of wax, it's always blocked with wax. Okay. So here, adnexal structures, and once this ends, no, this adnexal structures end, right? There you see the bony canal, okay? So cartilaginous portion has this hair, everything. You see that? Now, it's ended. You see that? You don't see any hair now. See? Can you see any hair now? That is the bony canal, where the adnexal structures are over, right? And in the bony canal, you go inside, see, there's a bony canal, and what you see there, here, can you see that middle part? That is the tympanic membrane. Okay, that is the tympanic membrane. Okay, I am sorry about the color of the image. Right. Can you change the color temperature? Okay, and the beauty of the tympanic membrane is, though it is just 0.1 millimeters thick, it is so strong. Okay, it can resist pressure up to 25 pascals per square inch. Okay, you notice pascals per square inch, PSI, on the tires you insulate on the tubes, you can inflate up to 20 PSI, 32 PSI, 35 PSI. The air drum can withstand pressure up to 25 PSI. Okay, almost like a lorry tire. So much pressure it can be hold. Right? So it does not get ruptured easily because of that reason. So much pressure is there. And for it to get ruptured, okay, there should be sufficient pressure. Pressure more than that to pass it to be rupturing. And that too should happen very fast, suddenly. Suddenly there should be a rise in pressure, only then it will rupture. Slowly the pressure rise, it will not rupture. Okay? Right? So when somebody slaps your ear, okay, so much pressure will go inside, it will rupture. Okay? So this instrument I am just taking inside. This is the tympanic membrane. 
And you see that tympanic membrane, you see that though I am holding its tray, you see that it's a, one part appears nearer to my scope, one part appears farther to my scope. Can you see that the upper part, you are seeing it's very near to your scope, where the lower and anterior part is appearing farther to the scope, right? Somewhere it is deep inside, whereas this part you see it is quite outside. So that's the angulation with which it is placed, 55 degrees angulation will be there. Okay, it's angulation, place an angulation of 55 degrees. Right, okay. So physiologically speaking, why this angulation is there is, your ossicles, what is required for hearing, middle ossicles, you know, right? So three ossicles are there, the malleus, the incus, and the stabis. The tympanic membrane is initially connected to the malleus, malleus is connected to the incus, and incus is connected to the stapes. All these things are attached like a lever, attached like a lever. And this tympanic membrane, this big structure is attached there and below we have one more structure, the stapes. Below the stapes we have what is called as oval window which opens into the vestibule, okay, which in turn stimulates the cochlea. And the secondary tympanic membrane called as the round window, right. So this oval window is there, tympanic membrane is there. So normally when you put pressure, like for example I am walking, if I stamp on somebody, with my shoes, okay, will it hurt or somebody with a heel shoe stamps on somebody, it will hurt more, heel shoe, okay, why, because, the aerial ratio, surface, from this part how much is getting transmitted, there is a same function the tympanic membrane does, the tympanic membrane does same, what we call as aerial ratio, the tympanic membrane is so wide, whole window is so thin, so sound from here is directly going there, so it is like, amplified because of that. So you can hear well. Next thing is because of the ossicles there is something called as lever ratio. Simple machines. If you want to open a lid of a tin, directly you pull or take a spoon and you lift it, it will come out easily, right? Same thing. So ossicles are there one to one. So movement because they are so long ossicles are attached to each other, the sound becomes amplified. So this we call it as the impedance matching function of the middle ear, the tympanic membrane and the ossicles. Impedance matching function when sound is getting amplified. So anywhere there is a problem in these particular things, you will have hearing problems. You will have hearing problem. Okay. I'll try to show you the ossicles. Okay, see the ossicles? See? Middle ear ossicles. See? We have seen. Okay. Oh, you mounted and shown. Okay. Right. All separate, separate, you have mounted and shown. So that's great. You have seen nice, so nice. We never saw the ossicles till we did ENT. So when you are doing surgery, like as I told you, so because you see in the ossicles, right? So when you are doing surgery, like for example, there is a perforation in the tympanic membrane because of an infection, chronic separate or dysphagia. You have to repair that. You need to repair the tympanic membrane with a new structure. So for that purpose, what we use is, anybody knows? No idea. Okay. So previously, we used to see, we used to use skin, okay, then we started using pig bladder, okay, then we started using this dura, seeing the dura, no, we started using dura, okay, then we started using cadaveric tympanic membrane, so many structures, at last we came to one final conclusion, that is 
temporalis fascia graft. Okay, the fascia which covers the temporalis muscle. You know where the temporalis muscle is located, right? So at last we have come to that. So nowadays we use only temporalis fascia graft. So we cut out the temporalis fascia, right? We cut out temporalis fascia into a longitudinal piece of 1 cm by 1.5 cm and we take that, okay? And we reconstruct the tympanic membrane. So the whole tympanic membrane, whatever is perforated, no? We lift it up completely, okay? We lift it up completely and in that place we are going to put this particular temporalis fascia and leave it there and it will heal in 6 weeks and that will look like an original tympanic membrane only. Right? There is surgery what we do for chronic separative otitis. Whenever there is a problem with tympanic membrane. If there is a problem in ossicles, what we do is we do ossicloplasty wherein we take out the ossicles, we reshape them and then fix it there. Okay? This is natural. Sometimes we use prosthetic also. We use teflon and titanium prosthesis, which are shaped like ossicles and we keep it there, say, ossicloplasty. But the best thing is always natural. Natural is the best thing because body will not reject it. Okay, it stays with them till the end of life. Okay. I'm very sorry, this clarity is not at all. Okay, so here, this bony part you are seeing, right? Is a tympanic membrane well? Okay. So when you want to do the surgery, okay. So you know the tympanic membrane is made up of two parts. That is, pars tensa and pars flaccida. So pars tensa problems are like little bit nothing too much to be worried about. Okay. They are not life threatening. Okay, but as far as flaccida problems, we call them as cholesteatoma. If we don't treat them, no, they will cause problem. So what exactly we do in tympanoplasty is, we take an incision here. Okay, this part. Okay, we cut it. I will show you that. See that below it is bone. Can you see? Can you see that? Once we elevate it, it is bone. Okay, right. So we lift it up, we gradually lift it up and then here we reach the annulus, okay, we lift the annulus and then we place the temporalis fascia graft and then we put back this skin water radiated from the bony canal, just a little heat. We don't stitch, normally we do skin grafting, you take stitch and all those things, no, here nothing, we don't stitch. We don't anastomose blood vessels and all those things. Some way God has given this particular ear a special privilege that it will heal without any problem. So strange. Right? No stitching, no glue, nothing. Just put the graft there, put back the skin. Okay, there's a beauty of temporalis fascia. Right? This bone is that. This bony part. Okay. Lift it. This is the annulus. Lift the annulus. See that? Can you see that? Thickening there. This whitish thing, can you see? See that? See that what you are seeing now, I am stop here because tomorrow other people will not be able to see if I do more. See, I have lifted this up. Okay? Can you see inside? So many folds, all those things, can you see? You can see one above a 12 o'clock position, one line, can you see? Huh? Okay. That is the middle ear. And what line you are seeing? No, all those are mucosal folds. Okay, this is the middle ear. Okay. So, middle ear is like, as per literature, we call middle ear is like a thumb print. Okay. Like Aadhaar, no? Right, you give a thumb print and your identity is recognized. Every middle ear is unique. Okay. That's what standard teaching says. No two middle ears are same. Okay? Can you see that here? That particular white thing I should see that? Exactly at 11 o'clock can you see a white structure? That is the long process of incas. Okay? And you see that? You can see that area. Now exactly at 12 o'clock can you see something? That is the oval window. 
what you are seeing there is the stapedius tendon the smallest muscle and the smallest bone okay 2.5 mg weight stapes okay and that is so much important for hearing okay that is the incus the stapedius tendon you see below now what is 3 o'clock position that is the round window okay that is the round window right that is the annulus okay so we see everything then we put back it we put this back we put the graft and we put it back see that how it has come nicely it has grown as touched it does it okay right so it is you put the graft there if ossicles any problem is there with the ossicles that can be done with endoscope as well as microscope microscope is not the microscope what you use in your physiology and uh, Microscope, not that microscope. You see the slides. We are operating microscope. <coughs> it is this big. Okay, it is a stand. We sit there. Position of the patient. We can see, and with both hands, we will be able to do the surgery when we are doing it. Right? Where am I putting the light? Huh? I am putting the light inside the inside the cranial cavity. Okay, temporal fossa. See that light there? Can you see? Huh? so the ear is not very far from the brain when we say the pars flaccida pathology no this pars flaccida is even more closer so any infection the pars flaccida can easily go into the brain and pass complications it can pass meningitis it can pass brain abscess all those things very easily right that is it's very dangerous okay for so such a thin bone the pigment plate is such a thin bone see that moment to put the light there you started seeing the light here in the ear okay so bone is transmitting light so not only bone is supposed to be so hard right in trans illumination when you don't see the bone easily but here that bone you are passing the light also so that is so thin right so coming to the nose you know from outside you will see the nose everything basically outside nose is only cosmetic purpose okay there's no major function other than cosmesis outside nose Outside nose only cosmetic, okay? So this patient has undergone nasal packing, okay? So cotton packed inside nose, right? Just clean it partially. The most, no, we call it the most paradoxical organ, right? Most <coughs> is organ of paradox. Inside the nose, so we have the nasal septum. Okay, now what you see to that side, I'm passing the scope to the right side. Okay, so this part is the nasal septum, which is made up of cartilage and bone. Okay, septum is made up of cartilage and bone. Right. So on this is called as medial wall. When you go from the right side, that is the medial wall. When I come from here, this is the medial wall. 
right? So nose is one, but it is divided into two sides by the nasal septum. Okay, usually it is two equal cavities, two equal cavities, right? So here is septum. So that is only thing, only function for the septum is to divide it into two equal cavities. It has no other function other than that. So main function inside the nose happens by this particular structure. What do you see here? So I am touching and going. See this? Okay. See that? So some more pack is there. So madam was telling, no, see a nasopharynx. Right? Once we go inside the nose, okay, this is the anterior fine. Once you go inside, you reach the fine, right? This is the posterior part. Okay, this is the turbinate septum. Okay, I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going back. See that? Inside. Okay, so that space is a post nasal space. Okay, your nasopharynx is that behind your nose. You cannot see the nasopharynx without the scope. You cannot see the nasopharynx without the scope. And such an hidden area, that's the reason malignancy of nasopharynx to diagnose itself takes a lot of time because you cannot see that particular area. You do endoscope and we'll see that. Okay, nasopharynx. Right? There's a pena. This is inferior turbinate. Okay. This particular structure is inferior turbinate. Okay, that is the middle turbinate. Right? Can you see that like balloon-like structure? Can you see? It's like a balloon. The middle turbinate. That's the middle turbinate. Okay. There's a middle turbinate, there's inferior turbinate. So this area between the inferior turbinate and middle turbinate, no, that we call it as the middle meatus also called as the osteomatal complex. Any problem in that osteomatal complex is going to cause sinusitis. Right? So sinusitis, when somebody is getting headache, facial pain and all those things, we do an endoscopy to see what is the problem there, what is the problem in the middle meatus. Is there any polyp can be there, mass can be there, okay? Sometimes stone can form there, what we call as rhinolith, small skits, okay? They put something inside, right? So that can cause sinusitis, during which time? We do surgery there, means we make it clean, we remove all that, what we call as endoscopic sinus surgery. Okay, endoscopic sinus surgery. Both sides similarly, the left side is a little bit narrow, I am not able to go easily. Okay. Here again, just above the nose, when you go, okay, just above the nose when you go, here you have the anterior cranial fossa. So your nose and ear both are related directly to the brain. You have the anterior cranial fossa, right? I will show you that. The cripriform plate. You know the cripriform plate, right? Okay.
from above, there is some packing is there. I am not able to remove that pack. Okay. This is a cribriform plate. Inside this, Okay, this area can you see? So that this structures can you see bilaterally? Okay. You see these things? Right? These are the ethmoid air cells. Ethmoid layers from inside it is packed. Probably they are packed so the brain does not leak down. Okay. So it is packed. Okay, these are the ethmoid air cells. So these ethmoid air cells, above that there is a thin bone is there, called the cribriform plate. Right? Whenever there is any CSF leak, any injury or all, no? this will give way easily and CSF will start leaking from the nose. What we call as CSF rhinoria. It's common sight. The common sight for CSF to leak is this cribriform plate where it leaks inside and it comes into the nose. And moment you bend forward, no, it will start dripping. Nose will start dripping. Water will start going on dripping down. CSF rhinodia. Okay? Right. So whenever there is sinus infection, there is sinusitis. And I just here I'll just show you some structures here inside. What is this? Very good. Optic nose. Okay. Optic nose come here, here are the pituitary. Okay. So to reach this pituitary, you see here the pituitary is there. To reach this pituitary, previously we had to open the brain, open cranial to reach the pituitary. Now because of the endoscope. It is from the nose itself, inside the nose itself, we can go reach the pituitary. We can remove all the air cells and we can see the pituitary. The sphenoid cells, the pituitary will be there. Okay. And pituitary surgeries can be done from inside the nose itself. There is no need for open craniotomy approach for pituitary surgery. Right. So you can reach it from so many places. You can reach from outside, you can reach from inside the nose also. Okay. Nasopharynx, there is so much of uh, packing there, I am not able to clear that pack. Okay, there is so much packing is there, there is no suction here. Okay. See this one, we are going retrograde. Okay, Uta. Okay. Normally it is supposed to go from up, because we cannot open the mouth, no? We are going from down. Right? So this is the trachea. Right? This big tube, tubular structure. Okay, tube. You see that? This tube. This particular tube this is the trachea. So behind that, this is the esophagus. Very good. Okay. So inside the trachea, you see that slit there? What is that slit? Very good. Okay. That is the vocal parts. Once you go into the vocal cords, we can see above. Okay? Right? I am going into the throat now. What is that? What is that? What is this structure? What is the structure? Ula, very good. That's a ula. Okay, that's a ula. Okay, this is the nasopharynx. You asked, no. There's so much debris is there, no. Like uh, I'm not able to clear that up. Okay. When you're breathing, so you are going the other way. So you start imagine the other way. When you breathe from the nose, air goes from the nose into the nasopharynx. <laughs> on somebody number one, and we need to cut somewhere else also. 
for the same patient all those things here what we same incision whatever we are taking we take a postural incision with the same incision you can get the graft also point number 1 point number 2 it is available in the graft properly anything problem is there it's available in plenty point number 3 the embryological origin is the same so chance of rejection will be very very less point number 4 it has a very very low basal metabolic rate as i told you we don't stitch we don't do anything we just leave it there so till it gets its blood supply through diffusion all those things it survives it survives okay the chance of rejection are very very less and lastly that thickness is almost similar to your tympanic membrane thickness 100 microns it is almost same okay because if it is thick you may not be able to hear properly if it is thin it can perforate because thickness is almost the same so things for the, all these reasons we prefer the temporalis fascia so i'll show you the nose okay so here one thing i wanted to mention in the ear okay so in the ear the upper part as i told you that thing So I am going to do one thing, okay? I am just going to focus inside. And there, this larynx, the main function is it has to direct. It has to direct the food into the esophagus and air into the larynx. That's the most important function. So this happens by the neural integration, swallowing reflex, and all those things, okay? So here I will just show you the larynx, how the larynx from under surface, from up, it's just two muscular folds. So vocal cords are nothing but a muscular folds, right? With a cartilage attached to the cartilage, thyroid cartilage anteriorly and arytenoids posteriorly. This muscular fold is attached there, and these arytenoids move. Arytenoids move in different directions, different shapes, right? To give the proper tone while talking. So voice modulation happens, right? You are able to talk loudly, you are able to talk softly, you are able to whisper. All those things happen because of the modulations in the vocal cords. Which is very very important. Is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerves. If the recurrent laryngeal nerves supply that, and because of which you are able to change your voice. And everybody has one frequency by which you can identify their voice, right? Our brain is so strong it can store everybody's frequency. More than how many other people you interact, right? Moment you listen to their voice, you identify them or not. You may forget their face, but you not forget their voice, right? So somebody talks, ah, oh, this person is there. Okay, he is the one who is talking, right? Depending on that modulation, that is the capacity of the vocal cords, right? And this can change. In singers, this frequency can change. Suddenly, it can become 400 hertz. It can come to 150 hertz. It can come to 250 hertz. Maintain there like the different different tonal changes. Okay, the frequency keeps on changing to give a nice musical voice. Yes. And vocal cords do not allow anything to go into the lungs. Okay, vocal cords do not allow anything to go into the lungs. They close off. Anything other than air tries to enter inside, it will close off. Okay, it will just close. That's the reason. Like when you are eating something, suddenly you get cough. The moment you tend to aspirate, vocal cords close. And moment the vocal cords close, you cough up. Open it up. Okay. And this position, what you are saying, no, it's little bit apart, right? It's not closed. So this position we call the cadaveric position of the vocal cords. Aspiration, all this is very dangerous. Okay. 
Beren evlidir. Beren evlidir. İşte. Nerede mi kanısın mı da kalır? Atra evlidir. Small doubts. 